In this lecture, I'm going to try to show that the God of classical theism is, is the engaged, personally present, responsive God of the Bible. I'm going to focus on just one proponent of classical theism, namely Aquinas, because Aquinas' work contains the representative classical theism that I know best. I'll show that for Aquinas, who is the most frequently invoked proponent of classical theism, an immutable, eternal, simple God is most certainly the God of the Bible, knowable, accessible, interactive with human beings, and responsive to them. As I will argue, the sense that the God of classical theism cannot be the God of the Bible is based on a mistaken understanding of the divine attributes at the heart of classical theism, at least in Aquinas' version of it. Make no claims about Averroes or Maimonides here. To see the apparent inconsistency, consider, for example, the Bible story of Jonah in the biblical book that bears his name. God comes to talk to Jonah, who knows God and recognizes God's voice right away. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and warn the people that their city will be destroyed in 40 days. Jonah not only understands what God is saying to him, but he understands that it is God who is saying it. Only Jonah does not want to do what God is asking of him, and so Jonah reacts to God's speech by taking ship to a far country. Once Jonah's on board ship, God responds to Jonah's attempt to run away by making a violent storm that imperils everyone on board ship. When the sailors cast lots to see whose fault it is that there's a storm, God somehow brings it about that the lots come out to indicate Jonah. And when, at Jonah's urging, the sailors throw Jonah overboard in consequence, God responds to their action by calming the sea for them. Cast overboard, Jonah begins to drown, and as he goes down in the water, he prays to God for help. In response, God prepares a rescue for Jonah in the form of a large sea beast who saves Jonah by swallowing him whole. Inside the beast, Jonah finally prays to God a prayer accepting the task that God originally sent him. Because of this prayer of Jonah's, God speaks to the beast who hears and obeys God's voice and spits Jonah out on shore. Then Jonah does in fact go to the people of Nineveh to give them God's message that their city will be destroyed in 40 days. The result of Jonah's prophesying God's plan for the city's imminent destruction is that the whole Ninevite people repent in dust and ashes. Because they do, God God responds to their repentance by abrogating the destruction of the city which he had told Jonah to announce. In this story, God converses with people, responds to their needs and prayers, issues prophecies about them that he decides not to fulfill, and in general, engages with individual human persons in close and personal ways. By contrast, to many people, the God of classical theism seems unresponsive, unengaged, and entirely inhuman. That is because on classical theism, as it is often interpreted, God is immutable, eternal, and simple, devoid of all <coughs> potentiality, incapable of any passivity, and inaccessible to human knowledge. So described, the God of classical theism seems very different from the God of the Bible. So let me begin by saying something more about the apparent inconsistency. The claim that God is immutable because God has no potentiality but is pure actuality has seemed to many philosophers and theologians to imply that God cannot be responsive to human beings, since nothing that a human person does or says could affect a change in such a God. The facts about God, one might say, are set, and nothing that human beings do can alter those facts. It seems that an immutable God could not answer prayer as Jonah's God does because, it seems, God's decisions cannot be altered by human prayer. A fortiori, since an immutable God cannot change his mind or retract a previously made decision, it seems that an immutable God could not first decide to destroy a city and then decide not to do so because of the actions of the people in that city. Eternity implies immutability. And so many of the problems highlighted in connection with an immutable God apply also to an eternal God. In addition, however, the claim that God is eternal has seemed to some contemporary philosophers to raise special problems of its own 
because it seems to imply that God cannot engage in second personal interaction with human beings as, for example, conversation requires. On this view, nothing that is outside of time could engage interactively with a person inside time. An eternal God could produce timeless decrees, but such a God could not answer Jonah after Jonah has prayed to God, and in general, such a God could not be personally engaged in conversation with a human person as God is with Jonah in the story. Finally, the claim that God is simple has seemed to some contemporary philosophers to imply that, at best, human beings can have no positive knowledge of God, and at worst, God is entirely unknowable by human beings. Unlike Jonah in the story, no human being could know a simple God or be engaged in interpersonal conversation with God. The anthropomorphism of the God who talks to Jonah looks antithetical to the incomprehensibility of a simple God. Even worse, the view of divine simplicity held by many of the adherents of this doctrine and many of its detractors too. The doctrine of simplicity seems to imply that God is only being itself, essa, and not an entity or a being, not an equadest. But if God is not a being at all, not any kind of concrete particular, it's hard to see how a human person could have a personal relationship to God and engage in conversation with God as Jonah does in the story. So understood then, the God of classical theism has seemed to many opponents of classical theism to be not only unbiblical, but even religiously pernicious. Nothing that is not an entity could enter into any kind of personal relationship with human persons, and in fact, it seems that no standard divine attributes, being omniscient, being possessed of free will, for example, no divine attributes of that sort could apply to something that is not a being. Or to put the same point another way, it's very hard to see how something which is not a being, but which is characterized just as essa, being itself, could be capable of knowing or loving anything. In the biblical stories, there is a readily discernible image of God in human beings, and conversely, a readily discernible divine original in God for the image of God in human beings. By contrast, there seems to be so little in common between God and human beings on the characterization of God in classical theism that it's hard to imagine why anybody would suppose human beings are made in the image of God. In the Christian world, in the Christian world, classical theism held sway for well over a millennium in a tradition that ranges from the thought of Augustine and earlier to the thought of Aquinas and later. Augustine and Aquinas both certainly accept the divine attributes central to the characterization of God in classical theism, immutability, eternity, and simplicity. And yet, it's noteworthy that each of these great thinkers also wrote biblical commentaries without giving any indication of unease at the combination of biblical stories and classical theism. What's even more noteworthy is that each of these thinkers, Gustin and Aquinas, supposes that the engaged, knowable, personally present, responsive God of the biblical stories is available to him personally. For example, in his confessions, Augustine addresses God directly in second personal terms, and he clearly assumes that God is available and responsive to him. A similar point can be made about Aquinas. In all his works, but especially in his biblical commentaries, Aquinas shows that he expects God to be engaged with all human beings, himself included, in such a way that God is known by human beings and is personally present and responsive to them. So now I want to raise two questions. Here's the first one. How is it possible that these good thinkers, Augustine and Aquinas and others like them, in the tradition of classical theism, how is it possible that these thinkers 
could also have accepted the picture of God in the biblical stories? That's my first question. How could they do that? They're smart. How could they do that? And here's my second question. Is it so much as metaphysically possible for the God of classical theism to be the God of the biblical stories? So those are my two questions. Now I want to approach these questions by what may strike you as a circuitous uh, route a circuitous, unpalatable, uninteresting route, but trust me, it's a good route. I'm going to begin, I'm going to begin by sketching Aquinas' views of the Holy Spirit and Aquinas' account of the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit when it indwells in a person of faith. And here, in case you're not clear about it, on Christian doctrine, which Aquinas certainly accepts, the Holy Spirit is God. All the characteristics of God are also the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. That is, if God is immutable, so is the Holy Spirit, and so on. If God's eternal or simple, then so is the Holy Spirit. It couldn't be that the Holy Spirit is temporal or composite while God is eternal and simple. Couldn't be. So I need to point that out to you so you understand that whatever Aquinas accepts as true of the Holy Spirit is for him also true of God. I'm going to argue and on Aquinas' views of the Holy Spirit, as I'm going to sketch him for you, God is as intimately and responsibly engaged with human beings, as knowable and personally present to human beings, as any proponent of the characterization of the biblical God could want. There is no difficulty, no difficulty in seeing that the God of the biblical story of Jonah could be the God Aquinas describes in his account of the Holy Spirit's interactions with human beings. On the other hand, of course, in the history of the thought of classical theism, Aquinas is one of classical theism's most influential proponents. So in the latter part of this lecture, I'm going to show why Aquinas' account of the Holy Spirit is compatible with his view of God as immutable, eternal, and simple. Contrary to some contemporary interpretations of classical theism, Nothing about these divine attributes as Aquinas understands them rules out the characteristics and relations Aquinas attributes to the Holy Spirit. And so both those questions I just raised have an answer. Aquinas accepted the picture of God given in the biblical stories because it did not contradict his own classical theist view of God. And, answer to the second question, he was right in that assessment. As I will try to show, nothing about God's immutability, eternity, or simplicity, as Aquinas interprets these divine attributes, precludes any of the characteristics of the biblical God. So that's my task, and here's what Aquinas says about the Holy Spirit. To show the way in which Aquinas thinks of the relations between God and human beings that are mediated by the Holy Spirit, it's helpful to begin with Aquinas' exposition of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. The very name of the Holy Spirit, as Aquinas explains it, is indicative of Aquinas' views. When Aquinas describes the Holy Spirit in the Summa Theologiae, he says that the name of the Holy Spirit is gift. And to explain this claim, Aquinas says, we are said to possess what we can freely use or enjoy as we please. A rational creature does sometimes attain to this, so as freely to know God truly and to love God rightly. Hence, rational creatures alone can possess the divine person. But this must be given to a rational creature from God, for that is said to be given to us which we have from another source. And so, a divine person, the Holy Spirit, can be given and can be a gift. And Aquinas expands on these views this way. He says, God is in all things by his essence, power, and presence according to his one common mode as the cause existing in the effects which participate in his goodness. In addition to this common mode, however, there is one special mode belonging to the rational nature in whom God is said to be present as the object known is in the knower and the beloved in the lover. Since by its operation of knowledge and love a rational creature attains to God himself, then according to this special mode, God is said not only to exist in a rational creature, 
but also to dwell in that rational creature as in his own temple. In Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas makes clear that in his view, God, the Holy Holy Trinity, the whole Holy Trinity, dwells in a person of faith when that person has the indwelling Holy Spirit. So the claims I just read are not just uh, about the Holy Spirit, but they're also about God. That's the point. So Aquinas says, since the love by which we love God is in us by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself must also be in us. Therefore, since we are made lovers of God by the Holy Spirit, and every beloved is in the lover, by the Holy Spirit necessarily the Father and the Son dwell in us also. Aquinas holds that the divine indwelling unites a human person with God to some no doubt limited degree. In so doing, it makes God available to her to know, to love, and to enjoy. This is a position Aquinas maintains and develops in many places. So, for example, in commenting on a line in the Pauline epistles, where the uh, writer to the letter says to the Ephesians, that you may be able to comprehend what is the breadth and length and depth and height of the love of God, Aquinas says this. He says, it's evident that God reveals himself to one who loves and that he shows himself to one who believes. Now, it should be noted that sometimes to comprehend means to enclose. And then it's necessary that the one comprehending totally contains within himself what is comprehended. But sometimes it means to apprehend and then it affirms a remoteness or a distance and yet also implies proximity. No created intellect can comprehend God in the first manner, but the second kind of comprehension is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and this is what the apostle means when he says to the Ephesians that you may comprehend, namely, what the apostle means is, that you may enjoy the presence of God and know God intimately. For Aquinas, then, the relationship between God and a human person of faith, which is brought about through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, is a relationship close enough and intimate enough to be thought of as a uniting in love. Expanding on the idea that a person of faith is friends with God, Aquinas says, in the first place, it's proper to friendship to converse with one's friend. It's also a property of friendship that one take delight in a friend's presence that one rejoice in his words and deeds, and that it is especially in our sorrows that we hasten to our friends for consolation. Since then, the Holy Spirit constitutes us God's friends and makes God dwell in us and us dwell in God, it follows that through the Holy Spirit we have joy in God. In fact, for Aquinas, the Holy Spirit so fills a person with a sense of the love of God and God's presence to him that joy is one of the principal effects of the Holy Spirit. Aquinas says, when the Apostle Paul says the Lord is near, he points out the cause of joy because a person rejoices at the nearness of his friend. So that's enough. In the long version of this uh, lecture, I've got a whole lot more such quotations. So. Uh, those who are inclined to disbelieve me are going to find overwhelming evidence from Aquinas' text. It is evident, in my view, that the God described in Aquinas' account of the Holy per Spirit, that kind of God, could deal with a person such as Jonah in the ways that the biblical stories portrays. I do not see how one could make it clearer than the texts I've cited do that on Aquinas' view, God is personally present to a person of faith in maximally responsive ways, communicating, counseling, and comforting, able to share rejoicing as one friend does with another. But here's the point, here's the point. Equally, I do not see how anyone could suppose that Aquinas is guilty of so great an inconsistency as to maintain this view of God when discussing the nature and actions of the Holy Spirit, and yet also to hold that God is immutable, eternal, and simple, if by those attributes, Aquinas means what some contemporary philosophers, friendly or unfriendly to classical theism, supposes, suppose Aquinas to mean. If God is not an entity, but only 
being alone, essa. If God is unable to act as a concrete particular does, if God's incomprehensible to human beings and by nature unable to respond to them, well then Aquinas' views of the indwelling Holy Spirit are so inconsistent with his views of God as to be really obviously ridiculous. And there really are not two Aquinas's. One who wrote the questions on the divine attributes in the prima pars of the Summa, and another one who wrote biblical commentaries. The same mind composed both of these. In my view, the solution to the conundrum posed by seeing that Aquinas accepts both classical theism and these views of the Holy Spirit, the solution consists in recognizing that the interpretations of classical theism on the part of some contemporary philosophers is not the interpretation Aquinas himself held. For Aquinas, classical theism's view of God as immutable, eternal, and simple is not inconsistent with the view of God Aquinas presents in his discussions of the Holy Spirit's characteristics and relations with human beings. To begin to see the consistency of Aquinas's position, it's helpful to start with the doctrine of eternity as Aquinas understands it. Contrary to the way it's sometimes thought of, as I said in the reading group yesterday, eternity is not just timelessness. The concept of eternity as Aquinas accepts it is the concept of a life without succession, but with infinite atemporal duration, where, of course, duration has to be understood analogically with temporal duration. God's life consists in the duration of a present that is not limited by either future or past. Nonetheless, nothing in the concept of eternity denies the reality of time or implies that temporal duration or temporal events are illusory. So let me uh, reintroduce the analogy I used in the reading group because it's helpful here. Consider er Edwin Abbott's famous flatland, a story about a two-dimensional world occupied by sentient two-dimensional creatures. In flatland, one of these two-dimensional creatures, a sentient square, comes into conversation with a sentient sphere who is an inhabitant of a three-dimensional world. The sphere in Edwin Abbott's story, the sphere has a terrible time explaining his three-dimensional world to his new friend, the two-dimensional square. As Flatland presents things, there is more than one mode of spatial existence for sentient beings. There is both the flatland two-dimensional mode of spatial existence and also the three-dimensional mode of spatial existence. That the sentient sphere is in three-dimensional space does not mean that the sentient square of flatland is really somehow three-dimensional or that the square's mode of spatial existence somehow really has any of the three-dimensional characteristics of the sphere's mode of existence. In the story, the two spatial modes of existence, that of flatland and that of the sphere, are both real, and neither is reducible to the other or to any third thing. An analogous point holds as regards temporal and eternal modes of duration. For those who accepted the doctrine of eternity, reality includes both time and eternity as two distinct modes of duration neither of which is reducible to the other or to any third thing. And yet still, it is possible, the proponents of the doctrine thought, it's possible for inhabitants of the differing modes of duration to interact. To understand the nature of the interaction, it's important to see the implications of the definition of eternity, which became standard after the sixth century. Because an eternal God cannot be characterized by succession, no temporal entity or event can be past or future with respect to, or earlier or later than, the whole life of an eternal God. On the other hand, eternity is also characterized by the duration of a present that is not limited by either future or past. Because the mode of existence of an eternal God is characterized by a limitless and a temporal kind of presentness, the relation between an eternal God and anything in time has to be one of simultaneity. 
Of course, the presentness and simultaneity associated with an eternal God cannot be temporal presentness or temporal simultaneity. In earlier work, Norman Kretzmann and I called this special sort of simultaneity ET simultaneity for simultaneity between what is eternal and what is temporal. If flatland were finite and linearly ordered with an absolute middle, there might be an absolute flatland here, which in the flatland world could be occupied by only one flatland or sentient square at a time. Nonetheless, if flatland were small enough, then from the point of view of a human observer in the three-dimensional world, all of flatland could be here at once. And yet it would not follow, and it would not be true, that all of flatland would be here with respect to any occupant of flatland. So it could be the case both that only one thing in flatland could be here at once, with respect to the inhabitants of the three-dimensional world, whoops, with respect to the inhabitants of flatland, and it could also be true that all of flatland could be here at once with respect to the inhabitants of the three-dimensional world. The reason for that claim that sounds paradoxical is that all of flatland can be encompassed within the metaphysically bigger here of the three-dimensional world. An analogous point holds with regard to the present on the doctrine of eternity. With respect to God in the eternal present, all of time is encompassed within the eternal present insofar as all of time is ET simultaneous with the eternal present. The logic of the doctrine of eternity has the result that every moment of time, as that moment is now in time, every moment is ET simultaneous with the whole life of eternal God. Or to put the same point the other way around, the whole of eternity is ET simultaneous with each temporal event as that event is actually occurring in the temporal now. But it does not follow and is not true that all of time is present with respect to anything temporal at any particular temporal location. And here, one thing to notice relevant to the purposes of this lecture is that one consequence of God's eternality is that in respect of time, God can be more present with regard to a human person, Paula, than any of her contemporary human persons could be. That is, as regards Paula, her contemporary Jerome can be present only, you might say, one time slice at a time. When Paula's 30 years old, neither her three-year-old self nor her 60-year-old self are available to Jerome. But eternal God is present at once to every time of Paula's life. None of Paula's life is ever absent or unavailable for God. On the logic of the doctrine of eternity, it is therefore possible for an eternal God to have the kind of conversation with Jonah represented in the biblical story. In one and the same eternal now, eternal God is ET simultaneous with every moment of Jonah's life. And in one and the same eternal act of will, God can will that he make one speech to Jonah, which Jonah apprehends at time T1, and another speech to Jonah, which Jonah apprehends at time T2. God's act of will, which is in the eternal now, can be for effects which are in different temporal locations. Furthermore, it is entirely possible and compatible with the doctrine of eternity that the speech God wills to introduce into time at T2 is a function of what God in the eternal now knows that Jonah says at some time between T1 and T2. God's eternality therefore does not rule out God's having effects in time or God's responding to things that temporal human beings do. At this point, someone might object that even if God's eternality does not preclude God's responsiveness to human beings, God's immutability does. But this is a mistaken objection. It is true that since change requires time, nothing which is eternal and therefore outside of time can change. That's true. And an eternal God is immutable. But it doesn't follow that an eternal immutable God 
cannot alter his plans or be responsive to human beings. An eternal, immutable God cannot be changeable across times, since God does not exist at any times. At each and every time, et simultaneous with the one eternal now, God is one and the same. That's right. And so an eternal, immutable God cannot do anything after something happens in time. But such a God can certainly act because of something that happens in time. So, for example, in one and the same eternal now, God can will to introduce into time T1 an announcement to the Ninevites of the destruction of their city in, within 40 days, and also will to introduce into time T2 the retraction of the destruction of Nineveh because the Ninevite people repented between T1 and T2. In making this complex act of will, God is not changing. God is responding to what the Ninevites do, but his responsiveness does not need to, re does not require any alteration on God's part. To generalize from the point about Jonah here, about the story of Jonah, in one and the same eternal act of will, without any alteration, an eternal immutable God can will to introduce different effects into different points in time because of what human beings do at other points in time. And now this brings me to the most problematic case. Some people have supposed that the doctrine of simplicity rules out precisely this kind of responsiveness on God's part. As I explained at the outset, on the view of some philosophers and theologians, the doctrine of simplicity implies that God is identical with essa, with being. On their view, God has to be distinguished from a being, an object, an, an idquodest. Furthermore, since being is just being and nothing else, God has no accidents. But then, this claim seems to entail that the only things God can do are the things that God does in fact do. And in that case, it certainly is very hard to see how God could be responsive to human beings. Now to see why some philosophers and theologians have supposed that these conclusions follow from the doctrine of simplicity, consider that if God could do otherwise than God does, then some characteristics of God would be contingent, not necessary. The contingent features of God would be accidents, or so it seems. That is, in medieval logic, an accident is just a characteristic that a thing can have or lack and still be what it is. Since the doctrine of simplicity rules out accidents in God, it seems to follow that everything about God is essential to God and therefore necessary for God. And so on this way of thinking about the doctrine of simplicity, God would do what God in fact does no matter what human beings do. And if that's so, then I don't see how God could be responsive to anything human beings do. But here's the point. It is perfectly clear and non-controversial that Aquinas does hold that God can do other than God does. In particular, for example, Aquinas holds that God was free to create or not to create. God's creating was not brought about in God by any necessity of nature. And since this is so, with regard to creating, God can do other than God did, on Aquinas' views. And if it's possible for God to do other than God does, then it's possible for God to do something that God does not do in the actual world, or to omit something that God does do in the actual world. But then, it's also not the case that God's simplicity by itself rules out God's responsiveness. It could be true, that is, even of a simple God, that if Jonah had not prayed to God, then God would not have saved Jonah from the sea. In that case, then in the possible world in which Jonah doesn't pray, God does otherwise than God does in the actual world, the actual world of the story, that is. And God doesn't, in that world, rescue Jonah. And since the doctrine of simplicity for Aquinas does not rule out such claims, then it also doesn't rule out for Aquinas saying that God rescues Jonah because of Jonah's prayers. And in that case, we have what we need 
for the compatibility of divine simplicity and divine responsiveness to human beings. Now those who suppose, contrary to Aquinas, <coughs> that a simple God cannot do other than God does, and those who, contrary to their own views, find themselves stuck with that conclusion, they go wrong because they interpret Aquinas as holding that God is being alone, only Essa. In fact, Aquinas' position is more nuanced and more sophisticated. In more than one place, Aquinas explicitly takes the doctrine of simplicity to imply that God is somehow, in some way we do not understand, both being itself and also a being, an entity, that is, both essa and it quod est. In his commentary on Boethius's De Hebdomadibus, where Aquinas spells out his position explicitly, he says this, he says, in simple things, in reality, essa itself and it quod est must be one and the same, being and a being. After giving an argument that there can't be more than one thing, which is both being and a being, Aquinas sums up his position by saying, and that one sublime simple is God himself. And later in that same work, Aquinas says, in God, essa and it quod est, being and a being, don't differ. For Aquinas said, on the doctrine of simplicity, being and a being are somehow the same <coughs> in God. And for this reason, Contrary to what some scholars have maintained about Aquinas' views, for Aquinas it's not true that God is just being. Rather, God is being which is somehow also a being, somehow also an it quod est. So on this view of Aquinas, it's right to say that God is essa, being, but this essa is somehow also a concrete particular, a being, an entity, an it quod est. That is, it's acceptable to say that God is being, provided that we understand that this claim doesn't rule out the claim that God is a concrete particular. Those who take the doctrine of simplicity to imply that God is not an entity but only being, therefore misread Aquinas' position. In effect, their interpretation of Aquinas takes the doctrine of simplicity to make God metaphysically more limited than concrete things such as com composite human beings who can do otherwise than they do. But this really is to get the doctrine upside down. The doctrine of simplicity implies that at the ultimate metaphysical foundation of all reality there is essa, but it also implies that this being, this essa, without losing any of its characteristics as being, is somehow subsistent and concrete and a particular individual with more ability to act and with more freedom in its acts than any concrete composite entity has. This interpretation of Aquinas' views of divine simplicity serves to correct a misconstrual of Aquinas' very famous and much discussed prologue to question three of the prima pars of the Summa Theologiae. When Aquinas says in that much discussed passage that we don't know of God what God is, quid est. Aquinas is not espousing a radical via negativa, a radical apophaticism, as many scholars have supposed. Rather, Aquinas is maintaining only that on the doctrine of simplicity, we do not know the quiddity of God. As Aquinas explains this point elsewhere, he says, with regard to what God himself is, God is neither universal nor particular. And what God is, is something that in this life we don't know. That is, on Aquinas' view, with regard to the quiddity of God, the best we can do is what you might ki call a kind of quantum metaphysics, analogous to the physics that characterizes light as both a wave and a particle. In some contexts, we can say appropriately that God is being, and in another context, we can say appropriately that God is a being, just as in some context, we can say appropriately that God is love. In another context, we can say appropriately that God is loving. But neither claim rules out the other on the doctrine of simplicity as Aquinas interprets it. 
Furthermore, just as the human inability to understand fully the nature of light is compatible with the developed physics, so the human inability to know the liquidity of God is for Aquinas compatible with a great deal of positive knowledge about God. Now the doctrine of simplicity is the most fundamental and also the most difficult of the standard divine attributes for the classical theism of the medieval period. And it's clear that many of the details of the interpretation I've argued for, for the doctrine of simplicity, many of these details would benefit from further discussion in order to ward off the objection that the doctrine's just incoherent if it's interpreted in this way. And if you would like a lot of that further discussion, you can find it in the book link version of this lecture, which has just appeared, actually, just hot off the press now. But the important thing to notice, the thing that's important for this lecture, is just this. This is the interpretation of divine simplicity that Aquinas, that exemplary proponent of classical theism, gives. That is his interpretation. And if we understand divine simplicity in the way Aquinas explicitly does, as perfectly compatible with the claim that God can do other than God does, then nothing about simplicity rules out God's responsiveness to human beings. So here's what I want to say in conclusion, and then I'm done. Genesis maintains that human beings are made in the image of God. But the relation being in the image of requires some reciprocal relation of, sim of similarity. Something X is an image of something else Y only if X resembles Y in some way, but then Y must also resemble X in some way. The biblical commitment to seeing human beings as made in the image of God makes it reasonable that the biblical God so often seems so human, such a mensch. Anthropomorphism is wrong-headed only if it's stupid, stupid. Philosophically literate anthropomorphism is exactly what one would expect of any worldview which affirms that human beings are made in the image of God. Classical theism has been widely interpreted as rejecting any kind of anthropomorphism and as making God totally other than anything in the created world. The God of this version of classical theism is so unlike human beings that it's false even to think of God as a concrete particular. On this view, the divine attributes of immutability, eternality, and simplicity preclude God's being anything like the God portrayed in the Bible. In the Christian tradition, and I would say uh, things about the Jewish and the Islamic tradition if I had the license to do so and we had time enough for it. In the Christian tradition, Aquinas is universally recognized as one of the main proponents of classical theism. And certainly he's committed to the view that God is uh, immutable, eternal, and simple. But as his views on the indwelling Holy Spirit make clear, the God Aquinas takes himself to be discussing is a God in whose image human beings are made. Aquinas' God is highly responsive to human beings and engaged with them in personal and interactive ways. He's a God who is a particular and personal friend to every person of faith, and he looks very like the biblical God. The God Aquinas describes in his biblical commentaries and in his texts about the indwelling Holy Spirit is, you might say, also very human. Aquinas can maintain this characterization of God even while maintaining classical theism because there is nothing in the logic of the attributes of immutability, eternity, and simplicity as Aquinas understands them that rules out God's acting in time, responding to human beings, conversing with them, and altering his announced plans for them because of what they do. As Aquinas understands these divine attributes, the God of the story of Jonah could also be immutable, eternal, and simple. And so, here's my last line, for that exemplary and influential proponent of classical theism, the God of the philosophers and the God of the Bible are the same God, not because the biblical God is, after all, a frozen and unresponsive deity, but because the God of classical theism is truly the engaged, responsive, intimately present God of the biblical story. And I'm done. Thank you.
Um, thank you very much. This is very interesting. I guess I had a little bit of a, a big picture question. Um, so, so even if the God of classical theism is um, compatible with the God that's presented in the Bible, you might think, I guess depending on your view of theology, that you would want something stronger, that the God of classical theism was actually sort of inspired by the biblical tradition, so that we could get some of the divine attributes out of these biblical stories. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm just wondering if you think you can, and if you, or if you think that's necessary to sort of make this case that, that these two gods are actually sort of one and the same. Well, certainly the people who, um, the people who worked on what we now call classical theism in the Middle Ages, they thought they were getting these divine attributes from the Bible. That is, from their point of view, the biblical texts are divinely revealed. Aquinas says you've got to have a biblical text to support, support everything that you do in theology, you know, non-derivatively. You've got to have a biblical text, and you've got to interpret the biblical text literally. So he, so he thinks you've got to get it out of the Bible, and there are a standard texts that um, are taken to support each one of those attributes, yeah. immutability, eternity, and simplicity. But of course, uh, biblical texts are susceptible of, you know, a ton of diverse interpretations. So, um, what do I want to say? The minute you pull out your proof text saying this shows that, you're going to find yourself in the middle of a crowd of people waving the text, eager to explain to you, no, it doesn't. So. Um, I could tell you what they think the proof texts are, but I'd rather not, because then we'll start fighting about whether those really are the proof texts really do show the point. But for sure and certain, from their point of view, they think you can do that. So uh, in the same way, you might say, um, the patristics thought you got the Chalcedonian formula for the incarnate Christ out of the New Testament text. That's not that easy either, you might say. You know. So, but, but yes, that's the idea. That's the idea. So what they're, you know, the way I think about it is this: they're looking, they're looking to be, the inheritors, of the power of the Jewish tradition, and the power of the Greek culture, and they're merging them in this way, in a way that makes them think they get the both the best of both traditions. Although on the face of it, these look like incompatible traditions. I just wanted to ask a question about the sense in which God acts because of what happens in time. Um, so I take it that there's going to have to be a fairly specialized meaning of because there. Um, not just because we, we typically think of causation as happening in time, not between time and eternity, but also because we typically think of a lot of standard cases of causation are examples where the cause is acting upon the thing which is being affected by the cause. Yeah, but could I stop you at that point? Yeah. Because I never said that what we had here was an example of causation. What happens in time gives God a reason, doesn't act on him as a cause. Right. So, so think about it this way. I discussed the story of Jonah because the writer in whatever year wrote the book of Jonah. If the writer of the, hadn't written the book of Jonah, I wouldn't have discussed it. But the writer of the book of Jonah does not act on me causally in any way. He's dead and was dead before I began thinking about the book of Jonah. So that the writer wrote the book of Jonah gives me a reason to discuss it, but doesn't act on me causally. Okay. Yeah, so that was actually going to be my, my question, was just to invite you to say more about this relationship of because of, and are you thinking that it's it's going to be strictly kind of univocal with the sense in which we act on reasons, or you think that there's something different going on in the, the sense in which it talks about what happens in time to be something that God acts because of? Nothing. It, it's part of the part of the world where you were discussing that nothing is said univocally of God and creatures. So don't want to say that there's a univocal sense here. Uh, 
and I also don't want to. What do I want? I don't also don't want to commit myself. That is, I want to say, it, it's not that something in time acts on God with efficient causation to have the result that God does what God does. But I do want to say that what happens in time gives God a reason, in some extended or analogical sense of reason, to do what God does. Something like that. So my concern is that with that kind of immutability given, um, it kind of opens God up to the objection that uh, he or she is being deceptive, is deceiving. So generally, if we say, I will buy, um, and then later on I change my mind, we don't think that um, I lied when I said, I will buy. But if God says either I will destroy Nineveh, and Nineveh will be destroyed, whichever he said it, knowing that in fact that won't happen, it seems like God's doing something very close to lie. So I like all these questions, but that one is my favorite so far. Really, really like that question. Okay. That seems to me completely right. But here, but he, the the you know the the presupposition and the basis which you ask your question seem to me completely right. But here's the thing to notice. Here's the thing to notice. Um, something about the city of Nineveh was really morally monstrous. So we have no idea what that was. But it was so morally monstrous that God was willing to, you know, destroy the entire metropolis because whatever bad you got out of such horrible destruction was better than that that should keep going. Okay. Jonah says to them, in 40 days your city will be destroyed or before the 40-day mark, or however exactly it goes, you know, within this period, your city will be destroyed. And they, in listening to him, 100% repent in dust and ashes. Now, it doesn't say they had dust and ashes, they were hoping they could manipulate God into not destroying the city. It says they repented. Okay, so guess what? What was Nineveh was destroyed. So here's God's prediction. <laughs> here's God's prediction. <laughs> Within 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. It could be destroyed this way, or it could be destroyed that way, but one way or another, we're not having this anymore. And that turns out to be true. I'm wondering what the notion of ETA simultaneity is getting for you in the bigger theory. Because it seems like uh, what you really relied on in explaining how people had misconceived eternity was that there could Eternity, you put God in eternity, it's a, uh, where God lives, we live in time, and there can be, uh, there's relations between the two, uh, dependency relations between the two, so some of the things that God wills have effects here, some of the things that happen here, uh, give rise to like divine knowledge. Uh, and I'm wondering why a notion of simultaneity is, what work a notion of easy simultaneity is doing in your theory, in particular because it's a very non-standard notion, being non-transitive and non-reflexive. Uh, and kind of hard to understand. Well, see, if you if you think that for God there's no succession of any kind. Succession. Succession. Okay. No no past or present, no earlier than or later than. But that nonetheless somehow God lives or wills or knows or something, then you gotta have a present for God. And if you think that God interacts with things in a different mode of existence, you're going to have to find a way of connecting these two disparate modes of existence, neither which is reducible to the other or any sort of thing. You've got to find a way of connecting them. Now, because all you've got to work with is present in God, you need an at-once relation, because at-once is all God's got. The definition of eternity is, God possesses all at once his whole life. So at onceness is all you've got. At once is a kind of a hard, it's a hard relation to spell out if you once really try focusing on it. I mean, if you, um, if you look to the physicist for help, it gets kind of complicated even for things in time, the at once relation. But as between things which don't share a mode of duration, the at once relation gets really complicated because you'd think you could spell out at once in terms of at one and the same mu, and you haven't got anything to put in the place of the noun there. 
So what Norman Kretzmann and I did uh, over uh, more than one try at spelling out this relation is try to spell out in detail the conditions for a relationship that could count as at once when there is no one thing in which these two come together. And that's what we, that's what we were looking for in ET simultaneity. But you've got to have some kind of at once relation for interaction if you've got one of the relata that has only at once as its way of being. I'm wondering about the, so the kind of mode of knowledge we have of God, given God's simplicity. So, and some other things you said here too, it might make it look like the kind of knowledge that Princess talked about earlier in here. Um, and also the kind of knowledge you would have given God's simplicity would be a kind of knowledge by acquaintance. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if that's the case, A, and then sort of, if it is the case, B, then whether or how philosophers qua philosophers would know God. Um, assuming that they have some kind of sort of knowledge by description, which would presumably try to catch on to some attributes of God or something like that. So philosophers qua knowledge, qua philosophers have knowledge of God, um, and not qua sort of standing in some second personal, immediate, you know, acquaintance relationship with God. So um, your questions hit right square in the middle of my big mania of the moment, and I'm afraid I haven't heard your question because I immediately uh, am so interested in what I'm interested in, I'm probably not paying enough attention to you. So if I haven't got it, you can ask your question again. But um, I would, so I think there is such a thing as a non-propositional knowledge of persons. And it's got some kind of relationship to Russell's notion of knowledge by acquaintance. How much relation it's got to that, I don't know. But um, Russell's idea of knowledge by acquaintance is kind of kind of peculiar. He thinks you can have this kind of relation to a universal, for example. Whereas I wouldn't think you could have knowledge of persons with regard to a universal. <laughs> so I mean, you know, the world is a very weird place. So you know, you, Chris is laughing, but. Uh, there's a story that goes like this. The physicist Richard Feynman asks himself this question, why am I so much smarter than other people? <laughs> yeah. And uh, when, he, when he came to the answer, this is what he thought the answer was. They know things about numbers, but I know numbers. Now, I have no idea what he was talking about, none whatsoever. <laughs> but I recognize, uh, I recognize a, a, a fellow focuser on this alternative mode of knowledge, see what I mean? <laughs> ally, recognize an ally. I don't know what he's talking about, but he seems to be an ally. So anyway, so maybe you can have this kind of thing with regard to universals. What do I know? What do I know what a number is anyway? So, but um, this is what I would say, um, what is it for philosophers to talk about God? Well, from the fact that you could have knowledge of persons with respect to God, it wouldn't follow that you couldn't have other kinds of knowledge with respect to God. But, and it also, it also wouldn't follow from the fact that you didn't have knowledge of persons of your own with respect to God. It wouldn't follow that you couldn't recognize the concept of knowledge of persons with respect to God and think about what that would mean, see? So, for example, um, in a new book on the hiddenness of God that Adam Green and I just published with Cambridge in that new book, um, there are people who want to say, look, uh, John Schellenberg's argument from the hiddenness of God to the uh, non-existence of God, that argument is marred because he doesn't take account of the fact that you can have knowledge of God in a knowledge of person's way, and if you do, you might have it without knowing that you had it, see? So here's my own small example to give the point. Um, one time I was lecturing at Wheaton, and um, the daughter of my next door neighbor at home was in the audience. And she raced up after my talk and said to me, who knew? I thought you were just Monica's mom. Okay, so if you had asked her, you know, do you know Professor Stump, she would have said, I don't know, I don't, who's that? But you know, if you'd said, well, do you know Monica's mom? She would have said, yeah, okay, so, so that would be, that would be a sort of complexity in the conversation about divine hiddenness 
that you could recognize and think about without having yourself any knowledge of persons with regard to the deity. So in other words, there's nothing about this way of thinking about the deity or knowledge of the deity that means that we can't, atheists and theists together, use these notions and talk about these things together. That's what I would say. So it's a question about God's knowledge, not okay. our knowledge okay. of God. Okay. Um, it looks to me in the Jonah story that God is announcing his, its intention to do something, mm -hmm. to destroy the city. Mm -hmm. And God meant something by destroy when God said that. Mm -hmm. If God knows that he, she, it is not going to destroy the city, which an omniscient God would know, I'm not quite sure God could have the intention to destroy it. So I'm worried not about, some, uh, maybe omniscience mm -hmm. is not one of the properties of the classical God. It strikes me that it should be, um, <laughs> if it isn't. Um, and so I don't quite get what we mean when we assert an intention for God to do something and what we mean when we say God knows something. Well, I'm a little unclear how to deal with this question because it seems to me that I have, in fact, answered it with, when Beth asked a question that looks to me very similar. I think I already answered it. But in case there's something in your question that you didn't find in Beth's, then I would say this. God's intention is to bring about the end of the city of Nineveh, the destruction of this which is the city of Nineveh. And he, God can bring this about in one of two ways. Either he can just annihilate the city by a decree of will, or he can announce to the people of the city that he will destroy them, thereby prompting them to become a different people from the one they were. By, by one means or another, it will turn out to be true that God has brought about the end of the city he but didn't God like. God didn't change his mind in that case. Well, on my view, on my view, God doesn't change His mind. He doesn't change His mind. I mean, remember that it's an immutable God we're talking about, so we don't have a change of mind. We have an intention to go this way in this case and that way in that case. It's a responsive intention. When you set the problem up, it sounded like you were saying <coughs> that the God of the Old Testament. God. Is a God that changes its mind. I did say. I did and say. I did say. It looks like that. It looks like that. It looks so like he. God it looks doesn't like he, change his mind. God doesn't change I, his. I think the people in the Old Testament would think you're not being quite fair with what they're saying. Yeah. Well, what? Well, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to finish this. So, so I guess what I want to say is, um, see the. Um, the Jewish tradition wants to focus very much, or at least some, some parts of it do, not all parts, but some parts, want to focus very much on uh, the menschlich kind of God, the humanity of God. And so uh, there's a kind of, um, what do I want to say, there's a kind of delight in that part of the Jewish tradition in finding stuff you'd think a deity couldn't possibly do and finding some text that makes it look as if uh, God does do that. I mean, I can't right at the moment think of the most um, egregious of those cases, but there are some that are really, really out there. But um, I guess what I want to say is something like this. So I love the spirit of that part of the Jewish tradition. I, I love those, that part of the rabbinic way of approaching the text. Well, here's a small story. It doesn't illustrate what I wanted it to illustrate, but it does show you, a, a, it does show you the mindset of this way of interpreting the text. So uh, how many wives did Father Abraham have? How many children did Father Abraham have? How many sons did Father Abraham have? Father Abraham had eight sons and three wives. Okay, the first one was Sarah. The second one was Keturah, the Egyptian, uh, Hagar, the Egyptian slave. And the third one was Keturah. He goes to get Keturah after Sarah has died. And the rabbis ask this question, 
who's Keturah? And they say, Hagar. What they mean is that the minute Sarah died, Abraham raced around to find this woman that Sarah had made him send away, and he brought her back into his house. Now, what I want to say is, um, I sympathize with this sweet and human spirit, but I'm not inclined to do philosophy on the basis of it, or even biblical interpretation. So I think it's a nutty way of explaining who Keturah is, or whatever the polite version of nutty is. I love the spirit that gives us this interpretation, but I cannot see doing serious biblical interpretation or serious philosophy out of this kind of spirit. Serious philosophy asks, you know, what, what would you have to say about something which is the creator of all there is? Where all there is includes space and time, or whatever it is that makes space and time. What would you have to say about this? And then it's all right to say it looks as if God changes his mind, provided, but he doesn't, provided you can get the basic lesson out of it that God is responsive to what human beings do, which is what you value in the claim that God can change his mind. But if you want to have the entire rabbinic approach where God is, you know, very, very, very menschlich, it doesn't look to me as if you really can do serious philosophy out of it. So that's what I want to say. So I'd like to ask a question about variation within what you call classical theism, uh, and particularly historically, about the relation between this medieval theism and early modern rationalist theism, um, about uh, the differences between a theism in which God does, uh, God only does all that God can do, and one in which God leaves undone things that God could have done, um, but chose not to do. Um, and uh, about the role of Trinitarianism, as opposed to the tendency uh, of a lot of theistic thought to become incre increasingly Aryan and to focus on uh, you know, God the Father as the creator and to leave out the sort of path that you took through the Holy Spirit. So I'm not sure I really understand the whole question, but um, this is what I would say. Okay, what, okay, I'll rephrase it one way. To what extent are you trying to justify the coherence of Aquinas? Uh -huh. And to what extent are you trying to use Aquinas to characterize theism as such? Oh no, not theism as such. Certainly not theism as such. No, definitely not. There's a thing called classical theism, which in contemporary philosophy of religion is often enough associated with Aquinas, but also with Maimonides and Averroes. And it has, in the contemporary discussion, say from the second half of the 20th century until now, it has, in this contemporary discussion, uh, found detractors and proponents who read that particular tradition in a certain way. And outside of the community that likes this way of uh, thinking about the deity, outside that community, there's a much bigger community that hates it. And one of the main reasons for hating it is it's said to be incompatible with the God of the Bible. So there's this attitude uh, within the Catholic community, there's this attitude within the broader Christian community, there's this attitude within the Jewish community. So for example, Howie Wettstein uh, at Riverside has been on a one-man war against classical theism, which strikes him as uh, both hateful and antithetical to the spirit of Judaism. But the thing picked out by classical theism is a thing which is going to describe only a very limited uh, subset of theism. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's not gonna, it's not gonna even describe the theism of those within the Catholic tradition who prefer Heidegger to Aquinas because they think Classical theism is religiously pernicious. And even in the medieval tradition, you know, by the time you get um, from Aquinas just a little step further downstream to Duns Scotus, uh, 
it's a real question whether you still got what we're talking about as classical theism, because although Scotus uses the same terms, he uses those terms with a few epicycles that seems to seem to wreck at least part of the ordinary understanding of those terms. So with regard to eternity, Scotus, uh, as far as I understand them, and I don't really have a license to speak about them, but as far as I understand them, Scotus thinks that God is eternal outside of time, meets the Boethian definition, but that there are in God instants of nature. And with these instants of nature, Scotus is covertly introducing a kind of succession in God that really does begin to undo that whole classical theist picture. So for sure, oh for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't learn about classical theism until later in life. And one of the attributes um, go, that was supposed to go along with classical theism was the divine impassibility. Mm -hmm. that God, uh, God does not experience emotions in response to uh, things about humans. And that just struck me as really wrong. And that also strikes me as um, not part of what I, what I see in the Bible. And I notice it's not listed in your uh, attributes of what characterizes classical theism. So I was just wondering, um, do you think it's not a part of classical theism? Uh, and what do you think about it and its relation to the God of the Bible? Okay, so I like that question too. I like all the questions, but, but I like Andrew especially. So, so um, you know, this is, a, this is a short lecture, and I had impassibility in, I have impassibility in, in the long form, but I left it out for the sake of the lecture. So, um, I want to say two things about impassibility. Uh, in the first place, impassibility is uh, generally taken, is generally given an interpretation. Let's we'll start again. Impassibility comes out of the same medieval tradition. It's frequently given a, an interpretation by people who don't know anything about the medieval tradition and who interpret it to mean something like God has no emotions or nothing can act on God. So I'm trying to think of a polite word for illiterate. <laughs> this is an untutored way of thinking about impassibility. Okay, so um, a God who's impassible is a God who doesn't have a pasio. Now what a pasio is in the medieval sense, is something like a feeling in your gut. It's, a, it's something which you can't have if you don't have a body. It's an embodied kind of thing. And since God has no body, he doesn't have one of those. But when Aquinas discusses this issue, he says, well, sure, something that doesn't have a body ha doesn't have one of those. However, you can take this basic idea transpose it to something that doesn't have a body and get that thing, and that's what God has. So love is a primary pasio when it is a gut-wrenching sort of an affair, but it doesn't have to be gut-wrenching to be love, and God not only has love, God is love. So, so that's the first thing to say. Uh, uh, turns out I have three things to say on this one. So, so the second thing to say is um, that impassibility is sometimes taken to mean not that God doesn't have a pasio, uh, it's sometimes taken to mean nothing can act on God, and since nothing can act on God, um, it cannot be the case that God knows what God knows in virtue of its being there. It, because if God knew what God knew because it's there to be known, then we would have passivity in God. So um, a hero in a certain, certain subset of the Catholic community is a scholar from the mid, a Thomas scholar from the mid 20th century named Gergou Lagrange. And this is what Gergou Lagrange says. He says, um, it has to be the case that God's knowledge causes what God knows, otherwise you'd have passivity in the knowledge of God. But um, I find this 
uh, an exa really exasperating position because um, Aquinas thinks that even for you, knowledge isn't passive. That is, he thinks that what you've got is what he calls an agent intellect, where to call it agent means it's active, it isn't passive. It's agent as in agens. So, see my cup? Okay. So now you've got this cognition cup. And this is how Aquinas thinks it works. Light reflects from the cup, strikes your retina, goes into your brain, some stuff happens in there, and we've got efficient causation from the cup up into somewhere in the middle of your brain, at which point the order of efficient causation goes the other way, and your higher cognitive capacities act with efficient causation on the information that has been transmitted to your brain from the cup. So that, in cognizing cup, your brain is active. Now you might think to yourself, I can't understand that. That is making sense to me. If you look in Kandel and Schwartz, which is the Bible for neuroscience, this is what you will find. It, the authors of this uh, standard textbook say, incoming perceptual data constrains but does not determine what the brain perceives, which is to say there's incoming data on which the brain acts actively to produce a perception. See. So even for humans, to know what is there because it's there is not a passive thing, it's an active thing, a fortiori for God. So that's the second thing I'll say. And here's the third thing I want to say. This is my favorite part of the answer to your question. So consider, <clears throat> consider the Chalcedonian formula for the incarnate Christ. One person, two natures. Okay. And the one person is a divine person. Okie doke. So divine persons are God. They're not, you know, a subset of God or a mode of God. They're God. So in other words, in the incarnate Christ, God has a human nature. Okay. Now remember that on the doctrine of eternity, there's no succession in God. That means that for God, there never is when God does not have a human nature. So although there's a beginning in time for the incarnate Christ and an end in time for the incarnate Christ, with God there is no such beginning or, er or end. There is never when God does not have a human nature. Therefore, God can know from God's own experience what it is to feel sad. God can know from God's own experience what it is to weep, what it is to be in physical torment, and these are things God will know from God's own experience in God's human nature, and there never will be a win when God does not have these experiences present to God. So there you go. No problem. My question is in respect to uh, divine simplicity and the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, in addition to uh, classical sources and the biblical sources, uh, Aquinas would also have been pulling from the canons and the creeds, Specifically, like the Athanasian Creed, which claims the Son is begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This would imply that being begotten and proceeding are attributes or properties of these persons, which would suggest some sort of complexity within the Trinity. Now, what was Aquinas' response to apparent complexity in saying that no, God really is simple, and would you agree with his assessment? Um. You have to understand that from the point of view of these medieval thinkers, or maybe from the point of view of the Orthodox Christian tradition, there are two things that are mysteries. One is the principle of union in the incarnate Christ, and the second one is the Trinity. So um, I'm not going to be able to explain the Trinity. I mean, we just need to start with that. Insofar as it's an official mystery, uh, I would be an idiot if I thought, if I, yeah, if I tried, right. So we just got to get that, get clear about that for, right at the outset. Okay. So um, given that I can't explain the doctrine of the Trinity, I'm now going to go on to say a whole lot of stuff about it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but none of this stuff constitutes an explanation, so we just have to, okay. All right, so um, the first thing to be very clear about is that the word person is an equivocal term. 
what we mean by it is that which has mind and will, basically, roughly put, something like that. In Trinitarian lore, that is not at all what it means. That can't be what it means because in God there is one mind and will, but three persons. So if you were thinking of persons as that which has mind and will, you're not going to get three as you need to on the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so what does person mean then in its other sense? Given that the word is equivocal, what does it mean in its other sense? What it means in its other sense is subsistent relation. Now here's how you, there's, so what I want to claim, this is my claim, you can't begin to understand the doctrine of the Trinity in any way if you don't first have a good grip on the doctrine of simplicity because actually the doctrine of, the simplic of simplicity is essential for even beginning to think about or spell out the doctrine of the Trinity. So the idea, the shorthand way of saying the doctrine of simplicity is that God is subsistent being. Where uh, subsistent being, it, subsistent being is, um, you might say, kind of an oxymoron. It means something which has the characteristics of a universal insofar as it's uh, being, but has the characteristics of a concrete particular insofar as it is an entity, which is what subsistent means. Subsistent relation is something which is a relation, nothing more, you might say. I mean, a relation just is a relation, and you can have a relation to yourself. So if I have a relation to myself, there's a relation, but, I mean, there's still just one thing. It's one thing which is related to itself. Okay, so all we have in the persons of the Trinity are the relations that God has to God, except that these relations somehow are also an entity, a concrete particular. There is a uh, quantum metaphysics move made about these persons of the Trinity as well. So the doctrine of the Trinity is the idea that in God's knowing God's self, there is a relation, and it's a relation that gives rise to something subsistent. And this subsistent thing is one of the other relata in the relation, and these two together give rise to yet a third relation which produces still another subsistent thing. It's as if, um, if this is any help to getting an idea of what they were talking about, if there's any help at all. If you remember C.S. Lewis's characterization of the lion, when the lion is first creating Narnia, everything the lion does somehow produces being, because there's so much life or being in the lion that everything the lion does produces something with vigor of being. And something in the same spirit of thought is what is behind the doctrine of the Trinity, that even God's relating to God's self by knowing God's self produces a subsistent thing. Something like that. That's the best I can do. In any event, Trinity and simplicity are so far from at odds with each other that um, Thomas Joseph White, who's a very nice Thomist, has written a beautiful paper in which he says you can't begin to have the doctrine of the Trinity if you don't first have simplicity. It's predicated on simplicity. So, so I also wanted to go back to the question of whether God changes his mind or merely appears to. And I didn't quite see in, in the response to Peter's question, why then if it merely appears that God changes his mind, isn't it also the case that he merely appears to be responsive rather than actually being responsive to what happens? No, see, the issue is this. Um, Suppose, so the first thing to say is nothing which is outside of time can change. Change requires time. Okay. So literally speaking, God can't change. But um, you don't actually have to, uh, you don't actually have to change to have alternate plans where which plan 
is put into action depends on what somebody else does. So suppose you're playing chess and you've got a plan. The guy moves his queen there, that's one thing. The guy moves his knight there, that's another thing. But either way, I'm getting the bishop right there. Now, in that case, I have a plan which is responsive to what you do. I can put my plan into action without changing, but I have different routes for my one plan to go, and which route the plan goes in depends on you. And I don't need alteration over time to tell the story. Yeah, so I, I thought that's how, how to answer political, but then I was confused because I thought that Peter's question was about omniscience, and the worry was that if God is omniscient, he can exclude one route right away, so the intention would be simpler just, you know, to cause the Ninevans to, you know, change their ways, right? Because he knows they will change. Right? So it's not like he has a, this diverging plan. You got, he has one yeah, plan. You've, got a, you've got a funny view of God's relation to time. And I don't know uh, if it's I... It's a Calvinist view of God's relation to time. <laughs> What, what is it? What is it? That, what is it? That, I mean, it's the question of Calvinist predestination. No, right? no. I mean, you've got a picture of time, so that we we can get to you worry about Calvin in a minute. But your your picture of time seems to me to be sort of like this. Look, um, God has the film strip of time tacked up on his bulletin board, and he knows everything there is to know in the film strip. But that's not the doctrine of eternity at all. Because on that picture, you are covertly smuggling in succession for God. There's God's looking at the whole film strip and then dipping down into the real thing to do something. But that's, that's not the idea. So the idea is that every moment of time, as that moment is present, is connected to eternity by a relation of sharing now. Something like that, see? So, um, what there is in this part of time is a function of two things. What God puts into time over here and what things in time put into time over here. So, from God's point of view, from God's point of view, the plan um, is going to be, God's whole plan of providence is going to be one extremely large, complex, disjunctive sort of a thing, because at every moment in time, he's interacting with the things in time. And I mean, just to show you, in case it's any help, in, there's, there's biblical warrant for this way of understanding what God does in the Jewish tradition. So in the book of Esther, Mordecai says to Esther, you've got to go talk to the king to ward off genocide. And Esther says basically, ah, I don't really want to. <laughs> and uh, Mordecai says to her, look, if you don't, salvation will come to the Jews from another quarter but you and your household will be destroyed. So now he's laying out exactly this sort of chess playing understanding of the way providence works, see, like that. So we don't have alteration in God over time, but we do have branching versions of God's one intention where the, where, where the nodes of the plan are responsive to the way human beings behave. Yeah, I guess I'm just a little puzzled about how the ties and the intention about what will happen in each one. It's not that, see, here's the thing I don't know how to convey to you. You're thinking before he can interact with things in time, he's got to know everything that happens in time. But that's a before and after relation that you can't get in God. So what happens at a particular point in time happens because of what God does before that in time, where the before in time is before for us, but not for God. That's the point. And now maybe we can go back to your question about the Jewish tradition, or whatever it might be. Did you have a question oh. about, no? 
Jimmy had was raising Calvinism. Calvinism. Oh, Calvinism. Yeah. Okay, Calvinism. Okay, go for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, the more that uh, ET sounds made, uh, since you had a, in the talk, there was the comparison to Flatland and the two-dimensional being interacting with the three-dimensional being. And the more I think about the less sure I'm tracking what's going on there, since it seems like the three-dimensional being can, I mean, I haven't read Flatland, but from your description, right, the three-dimensional being is interacting with the two-dimensional being. And I can make sense of that because the three-dimensional being really is in the first two dimensions. Uh, but they have a the ET simultaneity, which simultaneity means at the same time. Uh, this is the part I feel like you said answered somewhere, but I didn't pick up what the answer was. Well, if it's not, um, you know, successive time such as we know that they're at the same mode, and it's not, you know, eternal time, right? You know, it's the What's the, uh, I remember you, in your answer, him said that, like, okay, there's this problem about what noun to put in there, right, at the yeah. same what, but I guess I'm, I'm unclear about how the idea of, of, uh, of ET science is supposed to solve that problem. Well, there's a lot of questions in what you just asked. Um, so go, go back to the Flatland case. I said this more than once since I've been here. Every analogy breaks down right at the point where you don't want it to. And the Flatland case is a case about space. The issue of eternity is about time and timeless duration. So the Flatland analogy is going to have uh, severe limits. But what's useful about the Flatland analogy, in my own experience, is it helps people get their minds around the idea that one thing's mode of existence can be metaphysically bigger than another thing's mode of existence, so much metaphysically bigger that what count as very severe limitations for the smaller, metaphysically smaller mode of existence are no limitation on the bigger mode of existence without thereby rendering the smaller mode of existence illusory. So I would say, given what you said about Flatland, I would say it's not true that um, the sphere, it's not true that the sphere is in the two-dimensional world. It is a two-dimensional world. You can't have a three-dimensional thing in a two-dimensional world. What's interesting, see, uh, Edwin Abbott wrote this story because, I think, he, he was a theologian who got tired of not being able to explain these divine attributes to people who couldn't, as it were, think their way up the ladder of being, so he had this clever idea, invite people to think their way down the ladder of being, and they'll get the idea. That was a, that was a, clever, a clever teaching move on his part. So the point of Flatland is just to help you see, look, um, you could be talking to our sentient square Sam, you, Tom, the three-dimensional creature, and you could say to him, hi, Sam, and he can say to you, well, where are you? And you could say, well, I'm here. And he might say, no, you're not. I live in a world where there's an absolute here. Only one thing can be in that absolute here at a time. I'm it. I'm there. If I'm in the absolute here, obviously you're not. Now you're going to have to try to explain to him, well, your whole world is here for me. And now you can imagine the misfires that go on in the communication. Edwin Abbott is a genius in spelling these out, and in his story, the sentient square rushes at the sphere to try to kill him because he's got to find some way to get rid of this nonsense about the third dimensional. So that's how that goes. Um, the issue about the relation ET simultaneity is this. Um, any relation of simultaneity, whatever kind of relation it is, is going to be a relation where you want to say, as I said, that two things are at once. But it turns out that um, even for quantum physics, it's pretty hard to find the noun. I mean, what at one and the same what are two things simultaneous? It's not that easy to find the noun, even for us on relativistic physics. It's impossible, it is theoretically impossible to find that one thing that goes in the noun place when the relata are what's in time and what's in eternity. 
So what Norman Kretzmann and I did was try to capture the idea of co-sharing metaphysically different nows together by building a relationship in which one of the relata was temporal and one of the relata was eternal. And yet somehow, when you look at all the complexity of the relationship as we built it, somehow it still seems intuitively that they are sharing now. Something like that. So that's the answer. Uh, I want to press on the impassibility point. Um, and I uh, talked so long about that already. What? And I talked oh, so well, long about Well, maybe I can just ask it in a simple way, um, which is, so I took you to be saying you do affirm impassibility. As I a, do affirm a pass, impassibility. Affirm. I don't affirm that God has no emotions. I don't affirm it. I don't affirm that God has no passions, and I don't affirm that, I'm going to get the negatives count wrong, I think it is false to say that God uh, doesn't know what God knows in virtue of its being there. That is, I deny that God's knowledge is causative of what God knows. Yeah, so I guess... Um, and that's my idea of affirming impassibility. Like so. Right. <laughs> So, so just going back to a very concrete case, um, uh, somebody undergoes a, a horrible death or just something very ha bad happens mm -hmm. um, right now, you know, mm -hmm. for us now. Um, is it the case that on, on this understanding of divine impassibility that in response to that, um, God feels uh, pain or, or sadness as a response? And, and Another example is just... Wait, let's take them one at a time. Okay, okay, yeah. so, so here's an interesting thing to notice. Um, on Orthodox Christian doctrine, is it true to say that God suffers and dies, or is it false to say that God suffers and dies? True. true. It better be true. <laughs> It's, it's not po <laughs> it is not possible for God to suffer or die in God's divine nature. It's not possible. However, it is heretical to deny that God suffers, heretical to deny that God dies. Okay, so how are we going to make these things come out together like this? The eternal second person of the Trinity always has an assumed human nature. Therefore, anything which is true of the human nature is such that there never is when God doesn't have it. So insofar as Christ in his human nature can feel pain, can feel anguish, can feel sorrow, can weep, there never is when God does not have these things in the mind of God, because, see, the Chalcedonian formula is one person. There's just one, and that one is divine. Okay. So whatever is true of the human nature belongs, you might say, to the person whose nature it is, and that's the second person of the Trinity. Right, but I can see how God might experience those pains, like, maybe so there, or maybe this is more just clarification, so, so Christ would experience sinuses and, and such here on earth, but, but what about um, the pain I feel now or the people around me feel now? Um, it, is that, um, does God feel sadness in response to those things or just the ones that Christ experienced on earth? Um, you may just so just, but, just, but, just, but just follow the logic through again, Andrew, and you'll have it. It cannot be it cannot be that there's change for an eternal God. Therefore, as, I, as I've said several times, there never is when God does not have a human nature. Now, human natures don't experience things. Natures don't experience things. Persons experience things. So what has the nature? The person that has the nature experiences things. But in virtue of it being true that there never is a when in which God does not have this nature. It's, there never is a when when God doesn't have the experience that God has through this nature.
So insofar as the person who has this nature is God, there never is anything in what there is to be known that the divine doesn't know, that the deity doesn't know. Insofar as the deity also never has one when the deity doesn't have a human nature, as it were, attached to it, then whatever it is that the human nature can do, there never will be a before and after for that either. Before this point, God couldn't, and after this point, God couldn't. All right. That's as far as we get. Possibility is hard. So, do you think it kind of sounds like God's passive?